All right, everyone. So good morning. Um, we'll get started. I'd like to, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Saad Body from Elmhurst Hospital. He's going to be giving a talk on thromboelastography and the practical implications um, of this technology. Dr. Body is an attending physician here in the surgical trauma ICU at Elmhurst Hospital. He received his medical degree from King Edward Medical University and completed an internal medicine residency at Mount Sinai, followed by Critical Care Medicine Fellowship at Albert Einstein College of Medicine, and then a Nephrology Fellowship at Mount Sinai. And he's also boarded in neurocritical care and um, takes care of a lot of our neurotrauma patients as well as our other neurological patients. And is going to give us a talk about uh, TAG, which we just got about a year ago here. So take it away, Dr. Body. Okay. Thank you for the kind introduction. Good morning. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. I hope everybody can hear me and see the slides. Yes, we can. Good, yeah, thank you. So we'll uh, start talking about it. Uh, a little background. So this test, uh, thromboelastogram, has been around for almost close to 75 years now. It was developed in 1948 in uh, Hamburg. And uh, the advantage of uh, using this test or idea behind this test is to look at the coagulation system as a whole rather than looking at the components of coagulation system. So it has been around, it has been used in uh, surgeries which involves lots and lots of blood product transfusions. So liver transplant is an example where people used to use 40 or 50 units of different blood products during the transplant. And it was important to keep a balance uh, in terms of how much uh, coagulability the blood had because if it is too little, then a patient would bleed and the reverse would result in a thrombosis of the arterial anastomosis that they would uh, make to let the transplanted organ work. Same thing with the cardiac surgery as well. Now the, the requirement is less and less, but that involves putting a patient on a heart-lung bypass machine when it is on pump cabbage that requires the blood to be thin, but at the same time, it does not need to be so anticoagulated that it results in catastrophic bleeding. So the test has been around and uh, it is now being used outside of those two primary indications. And uh, in uh, this particular field of neurosurgery and, and neurologic emergencies, a few cc's of blood can mean a difference between life and death or a life and uh, of a healthy life or a life with catastrophic uh, permanent disability. So what are our conventional tests uh, that uh, we, we look? Uh, we look at a platelet count when we get a CBC, but that just gives us an idea about the number of platelets. It doesn't really tell us how effective or efficient those platelets are in terms of participating in coagulation. We could have a platelet functional assay, but again, that particular assay is only going to give us an idea about the platelets. It's not going to give us an idea about the, the rest of the components of uh, clotting uh, cascade. When we look at a basic metabolic panel, yes, if you see somebody with elevated bilirubin, then you think, oh, maybe this person has an underlying liver disorder or an elevated BUN or creatinine, and that raises our suspicion that, oh, we should be a little mindful that could this person be prone to have uh, unexpected bleeding. And then we look at our uh, tests, which give us an idea about extrinsic and intrinsic pathway and uh, how all of this gets entangled together by looking at the fibrin again. We can also get history from a patient if he's able to, to, to give it to us in, in terms of elective uh, cases that uh, do they bleed when they're brushing their teeth or if there's a family history of bleeding uh, diastasis or when they get seemingly minor trauma, do, does it result in them having unexpected response with bruisability or swelling of their joints and medications. But again, it's oversimplification. All of us respond differently to medications. So a person, two people may be taking aspirin, one of them may have completely inhibited platelets and another person may have, uh, for all practical purposes, functional platelets. And the same thing goes with uh, nutritional supplements which are available over the counter. People may be taking it thinking that this is something which is beneficial, not realizing how it affects their ability of blood to form a clot. So, so when we look at uh, the clotting mechanism, it involves primary hemostasis where platelets are involved and then establishment of that clot where the clotting factors come into play. And then once it is no more needed, uh, the thrombolysis so that the clot doesn't keep on propagating and cause uh, untoward consequences. So all of these uh, things can be assessed when we look at thromboelastography. So there are two commercial uh, preparations which are available. Uh, the one which is commonly used or, or more commonly used is thromboelastogram or the TEG. 
And uh, the one uh, which is less commonly used is uh, Rotom. The difference between the two is, is how the mechanics of this test work. So it involves taking a small amount of blood, less than a cc of blood, is placed in a, in a device and this cup. And then depending upon what type of test, in tech, this cup is going to start to oscillate or move. And in Rotom, the pin is going to move. So as this movement takes place, the blood uh, clot formation is going to start uh, to, to take place. And because of that, there is going to be increase in the force, which is transmitted through either of these two mechanisms. And then that mechanical force of formation of blood clot is transmitted and it results in production of a graph and that graph can be interpreted in various ways that we will go about but the basic difference between the, these two types of tests is what part of mechanical device is going to be moving this is just a simplified uh, difference between the two the other differences are what type of reagents are uh, placed in uh, in, in rotom as as opposed to to tech and we can see that as the as strength of the plot is increased this uh, changes in mechanical uh, transmission of force result in formation of a graph. Now, when we are looking at thromboelastogram, we'll focus more on it, uh, not talking about uh, rotum because otherwise it gets a little confusing, although the basic principles are the same. The first value that we obtain is when the clot starts to form, because before the clot is formed, this blood, blood is liquid, so there will be no impedance in movement of uh, of, of this uh, device or, or, or the pin. Uh, so, so we are talking about tag, it's going to be the cup which is moving. So there is no problem in moving movement of the cup because the blood is liquid. But once it starts to clot, obviously the movement gets impeded and that's where this clot formation takes place. So the amount of time before, it, the, which is elapsed before this uh, impedance is first detected is known as the R time. And the R time gives us an idea about the functioning of uh, clotting factors. So it doesn't differentiate at this point between intrinsic and extrinsic clotting factors. But if the R time is prolonged, this is uh, gives us an idea that it is taking too long for our blood to make a clot and we fix it by giving our patients FFP. Okay. Second thing is once the clot starts to form, how soon it is forming. And that's where this concept of alpha angle comes in. In some places it is uh, uh, noted as a K time. So that gives us an idea about the initiation of clot formation. And that practically translates into the role of fibrinogen. So if it is taking this clot for too long to form, but once it starts to form, if it is not forming soon enough, or it is not gaining its strength soon enough, that gives us an idea that there is something wrong with the fibrinogen. And that's uh, where we uh, therapeutically can administer our patient cryoprecipitate. Once the clot is formed, we have this test gives us an idea how strong this clot is. And that's where this concept of maximal amplitude comes in. And the two, the two primary components of this maximal amplitude are platelets and fibrinogen. Again, the fibrinogen was an easy, in the initial part, but then once the clot is formed, if the clot is not strong enough, it tells us that something is wrong with our platelets. Our platelets are not contributing enough, enough in it. And we can see the difference that 20% of this maximal strength is contributed by fibrinogen and 80% is contributed by platelets. So this is where this comes in, that how soon you know, the clot starts to form, how long it takes to make the form, how soon it forms, how strong it is. And then once it is formed, how long it lasts. So if it doesn't last too long, something is wrong with that fibrinolytic uh, system. It is overactive. And that's where we can use anti-fibrinolytic uh, medication. An example of that is tranexamic acid. So, so these are the three main components that how soon the clot forms, how strong it is, and how long it lasts. So this is the information that we get from our standard test. Tech. But this type of information can take time. And uh, th is there a way in which we can obtain the similar information which would result in our therapeutic interventions in a, in, a, in a less amount of time? That's where this concept of accelerated tech comes in. So in accelerated tech, certain reagents are added. So that the, the type that we have, we add colon, which uh, uh, stimulates the intrinsic pathway gives us the same information. The R time over here is going to give us an idea that how soon the clot is forming. And if it is taking too long for this clot to form, then it gives us an idea that we need to give our patients FFP. The difference between accelerated tech and standard tech uh, is that uh, this information is available within one to two minutes, whereas in standard tech, it can take five to seven minutes. So that's where this comes in. 
And the skull end also gives us an idea about the lysis of the clot. So these two parts, that's why it shows up over here as CK in the top corner and the top column and the last column. These give us an idea that how soon the clot is forming and how long it is taking for it to dissolve. The other components, uh, which are the reagents which are added, one is citrate. It gives us uh, the idea that about the contribution, as we said, that the strength of a clot is dependent on contribution of fibrinogen and platelets. So how do we differentiate between these two? We look at this CFF time. It shows up as a separate clot, which will isolate the contribution of fibrinogen and formation of clot strength. And the second thing is the CRT time. So which is, again, both of these are maximal amplitudes, but they differentiate platelets from the fibrinogen. So once we have this information in accelerated tech, it gives us the therapeutic targets or the interventions that we can do. So if our, our time is too long, we give them FFP. If our CRT or the maximal amplitude and citrated is uh, is not wide enough, is not strong enough, we give our patients platelets. If the CS CFF is, is too narrow, we give them something to supplement fibrinogen. So at Elmhurst, we have precipitate. That's, that's what we use. And if the clot is not lasting long enough, we give them cranlexine TXA so to take care of that. Okay, so why, what is the advantage of using tech? Because we have the same information, we can argue sort of available when we are looking at individual components, when we are looking at PT and APTT, and when we are looking at fibrinogen and the platelets. The advantage of tech is that it gives us a real time information, how these components of clotting mechanism are acting in that particular individual. So ideally, if we have an ability, let's say somebody is coming in for an elective procedure and they are likely to, you know, encounter some degree of bleeding, we should have a baseline tech for that particular patient. And if there is an incidence where they need transfusion of blood products and they have been given, we can have a subsequent tech and compare the two values to give us an idea that is this person back to what his baseline is or not. Because the normal ranges in tech are, 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 are slightly wide. So if you use it twice, it gives us an idea about that particular individual's uh, baseline. And it doesn't take that long, and it is fairly accurate and fairly helpful. So this is an example of uh, accelerated text. Over here, we can see that the R time, which this information is available within two to three minutes. So we don't have to wait for the completion of the whole test because these things are, as this test is being uh, performed, uh, we have access uh, to a website uh, through our lab where you can see where we can see these form gra graphic forms uh, being resulted in real time. And if it is taking too long for this plot to form, we know that th this particular patient of ours needs FFP there and then, irrespective of what their INR is, irrespective of what their PT, APTT is. And those tests actually have a longer turnaround time time because it can take easily up to 30 minutes to get the results of uh, co coags back. So over here, we get this information uh, within a matter of two to three minutes. Now, the second thing, as we said, is how strong this clot is and how rapidly that clot is achieving its strength. If it is taking too long for it to achieve its strength, we give our patients cryoprecipitate to take care of it. And if it is not strong enough overall, meaning thereby the maximal amplitude is less, we give our patients platelets. So right there and then in about five to seven minutes, we will have this information that this particular patient of ours in whom we are encountering more than usual bleeding, does he need platelets irrespective of what his platelet count is? Or does he need cryoprecipitate irrespective of what that particular patient's fibrinogen is? And then if we have time and if this information is available, if this uh, formation of clot is, is, is not la lasting long enough, then that gives us an idea that we can give TXA. So most of the time, it's going to be these first three components that how long it is taking for clot to form. If it is taking too long, we give our patients FFP. It's, it is starting to form in time, but it is not achieving its maximal amplitude. It's taking too long for it to achieve reasonable strength. We give our patients cryoprecipitate. It has achieved its maximal amplitude of strength, but this is not strong enough. This is not sufficient for us to achieve proper hemostasis. We give our patients platelets. So that's how we interpret these results and, and use them. And there are various algorithms uh, which are available, which basically give us the same information that in the beginning part, we use FFP. Then if we have cryoprecipitate or fibrinogen concentrate, we will use that. 
or we will use that in isolation or in combination with platelets. And if the clot is not lasting long enough, we give them the DXA. Okay. Any questions about this so far? Uh, All right, so we, we, okay. we, can, we can go over. Okay. So, so, I'm sorry, any, uh, is there any question? Or? Uh, I don't think so. If, if people do have questions as we're going along, just put them in the chat and we can also come back to them at the, okay. end, of the, the end of the lecture as well. Okay, all right. All right. So, so there are different algorithms which are in place, but it basically gives us the same idea. Look, if, if, if a person comes in right there and then and we have none of this information available and the patient is hemodynamically unstable, please go ahead and give them massive transfusion because we don't want to wait for, for the STEG result to come back to restore their hemodynamics. But once we have some degree of hemodynamic stability, that's where we can guide or taper our further resuscitation for blood products based on the results of uh, these tags. And again, the information is going to be helpful in deciding, do we need to give this patient more FFP? Do we need to give this patient more cryoprecipitate in isolation or cryoprecipitate and platelets together? Or towards the end, do we need to give them TXA. TXA can be uh, slightly tricky because depending upon what type of uh, procedures are being performed and the procedures that, uh, you know, which are done by neurosurgeons, these are our micro microvascular procedures. So I would have my reservations. It's not in my direct area of expertise, but I would have very reservations about using TXA unnecessarily. If somebody is, if you're encountering major bleeding and, we, you know, it's, it's a life and death situation, by, by all means, use it. But and this is uh, another way of uh, showing these graphs. Uh, they usually ask them in exams in uh, general surgery. I don't know if they will ask that in neurosurgical uh, board exams or not, but it conveys the same thing in a graphic form. So over here, the top one is basically the clot is not taking too long. It forms, it achieves its strength fairly soon. And once it is, it has achieved its strength, it's fairly, fairly wide and it lasts for a decent amount of time. So that is how a normal tech looks like. The one underneath, right below it is, we can see that it is taking too long for the clot to form. So this is where we are going to give FFP to our patients. Over here, the number three from top, we can see that the clot starts to form. It takes longer, but not as long as the one on top. But once it's forming, it's taking too long for it to get a decent amount of width. So this is where we are going to give cryoprecipitate. Over here, we can see that it didn't take too long for the clot to form. It started to achieve its maximal amplitude pretty soon, but the maximal amplitude is very less. It's not as, as, as wide or it's not as strong of a punch if you want to use that analogy. It's more like a two finger punch rather than a four finger punch. So over here, we are going to give our patients platelets, okay? And the next form is, again, it's taking a little long for it to form. It forms fairly rapidly, you know, sort of reasonable strength but it doesn't last very long at all. It just, this starts to disappear. And this is an example where, we're, where we are going to give uh, TXA. And look over here, what is taking place over here? It's not taking too long for it to form. It forms very wide, more than what it should be. So this is an example that this uh, process of uh, clotting is overactive. But once it takes place, it doesn't last uh, that long. So this is an example of uh, DIC, a graphic representation. And the last one over here, again, we can see it formed pretty soon. It achieved its maximum strength. In fact, it became very strong. And then it just does not disappear at all. So this is an example where there is thrombosis, which we are, we are prone to have thrombosis. So, so these the graphic forms also give us a visual about the information that we will get by looking at the results of various timings. Now, I don't know how many of you follow Dr. Hickman on Instagram, but he's pretty good at making different types of cocktails. So if this graph becomes too hard to, to, to remember, you can look at the analogy by looking at different types of uh, beverage uh, glasses, all right? So it, basically this is a normal graph. This is probably a wine glass, if I understand it correctly. So it's taking too long and that's where we are going to give FFP. Over here, it formed, but it is not strong enough. It's more like a champagne suit. So in these cases, we are going to use platelets. And this, correct me, Dr. Hickman, if I'm wrong, is a martini glass. So over here, this is an example where the clot just starts to disappear too soon. And over here, we, we, we will use uh, TXA. It doesn't have a beverage of my choice, which is beer, but anyways. So, so this was uh, one aspect of 
uh, using tech. So we also spoke about using, uh, getting an idea about the functioning of platelets. So, so the tech device that we have at Elmhurst, and I believe it's the same at uh, Sinai as well, also gives us an idea about the functioning of uh, platelets and how effective those platelets are. And why it is important, because if the platelets are there in number, but they are not there in their functionality, the maximal amplitude of clot, which will be achieved, is going to be insufficient for uh, coagulation to, to proceed and to prevent our patient from uh, bleeding. So how do we get an idea about that? We get an idea again with the same concepts that uh, the platelet uh, functioning will be mapped by looking at the maximal amplitude, how wide this is. There is going to be a reagent added to it, which is going to separate the contribution of fibrinogen to the formation of the clot. And they are going to use certain activators. So one activator, which is arachidonic acid, is going to give us an idea how responsive the platelets are when they are stimulated. So if they have been blocked because of something which has action similar to aspirin, they are not going to respond to this. And also to adenosine diphosphate. So if they were taking something similar to Plavix, it, they are not going to respond to it. So that's how we get an idea about how inhibited the platelets are. And depending upon which circumstances uh, this, this test is being used, this can either be a good thing or a bad thing. So let's say somebody had a stent placed uh, during a vascular procedure, and we want their blood to flow, and they are on antiplatelets. Over here, in, the, in those circumstances, we want our platelets to be less responsive to the stimulation, because that gives us an idea that they have been adequately inhibited by aspirin or plavix. Whereas if it is a situation in which a patient is undergoing a procedure and they are at risk of bleeding, we want the platelets to be responsive to this stimulation, to arachidonic acid and to ADP. So this is a graphic representation that this red graph gives us an idea about the overall clot strength. This green graph underneath separates or teases out the contribution of fibrinogen to clot strength. And this white line in between gives us an idea how responsive the platelets are to a particular stimulating agent. So let's say we have given arachidonic acid, AA, for, to see if they are responsive to it or not. So over here in this particular example, we can see that they are fairly responsive. So this is an example of platelets where they are functioning properly. If the opposite of it was taking place, let's say we gave them the stimulation, but this white line was very close to the green line, that gives us an idea that they have been inhibited. So that's how we interpret these, these graphs. And this is an example of the same, that overall you get an idea how, what is the maximal uh, clot strength. You separate out the contribution by the fibrinogen and you look at the response of the platelets to these medications. So we can see over here that this was the maximal strength when the fibrinogen was separated out and when the stimulating reagent was added, platelets did not respond to it at all. So this is, and this is an example where the platelets have been maximally inhibited. And it is reported in terms of percentage inhibition. Over here, we can see that the fibrinogen has been teased out. This is the overall maximal strength. I hope you can see my arrow moving on the screen. And once the reagent is added, again, the platelets have responded completely to it. So they have become completely active. So this is an example where they are not at all inhibited by the drug. So, so this, this is how you get an idea about percentage inhibition and percentage aggregation. So over here, they are not at all inhibited, whereas in this top example, they are 100% inhibited. When in real life, it's going to be certain percentage of, of inhibition and uh, aggregation. Okay, so this is another uh, graphic example. So we can see that uh, this is the overall strength. Middle part is contribution of fibrinogen. Then the drug is added. And we can see that this, this green arrow gives us an idea that inhibition is there, but it's not that much. Whereas over here, the inhibition is way more than the middle graph. Same thing up over here, uh, the contribution of fibrinogen is, is teased out, and then the reagent is added. Once the reagent is added over here in the far left, there is 
100% aggregation and response to reagents. So these are good platelets. Over here, there is response, but not as good as the one on the left. So over here, if we are encountering bleeding in this situation, we will give our patients platelets. Whereas over here, they are not at all responsive. So they have been completely inhibited. And again, depending upon the circumstances, if a patient is needs an antiplatelet medication because a stent has been placed. This is how we want our patients' platelets to respond to that. They are completely inhibited and they do not uh, respond to the stimulation by that particular reagent. Whereas if we are encountering bleeding, we want our patients' platelets to be the way they are on the far left, that they 100% response to the stimulation, meaning thereby they will contribute uh, effectively to clot formation. This is how uh, these results uh, show up uh, in EPIC. I hope this uh, screen uh, shows up. But, but basically, the, the first thing gives us an idea about the maximal amplitude. So if the maximal amplitude in itself is less than 50, that our answer is, is there, right there and then, that this clot is not strong enough and probably it needs help by giving our patient cryoprecipitate or fibrinogen. Since we are talking specifically about the platelets, we can look at the contribution of fibrinogen. The second number will give us an idea how, how effective it is. And then subsequently, how responsive the platelets are when ADP and AA is ad added. And that percentage of inhibition or percentage of aggregation gives us an idea about the effectiveness of the uh, platelets. So we can see this, the percentage aggregation if this was a patient who was on aspirin and his platelets are still aggregating, it tells us that he's not responding to aspirin at all. Whereas up over here, where there is percentage of inhibition, if this is very high, it gives us an idea that this person's platelets have been completely inhibited, either because he was taking that medication or he's taking some type of supplement. It could be alcohol, it could be a herbal supplement, or it could be a nutritional supplement, which is resulting in platelet inhibition. Right. So this is just uh, showing the same thing in, uh, in a different way, how the 38% of platelets have been inhibited over here by aspirin. And whereas over here, we can see the graph is far away from the maximal amplitude, gives us an idea that almost 95% of platelets have been inhibited. And we can look at the numbers here as well. So, so many times, if these values are not uh, wide enough, it, it will say, in a, and unable to calculate the percentage inhibition. But we can get the similar information by looking at the maximal amplitude. If the maximal amplitude is low, it tells us that the fibrinogen and platelets are not contributing in, in the way that they should be. I won't get into too much details of uh, studies which have uh, been uh, published in terms of neurosurgical patients, but they have been case series and reports which give us an idea which are suggestive of how in cases of ischemic strokes, if a patients have abnormal tech towards hypercoagulability, the size of infarct is going to be more. And the opposite as well, that if they have abnormal <clears throat> tech, uh, are they more likely to need a neurosurgical intervention? Are these the patients who, let's say, came in with a trauma and they also had a component of traumatic brain injury based on their tech, how likely they are to need neurosurgical interventions. But this particular review article, it came in not, uh, maybe a couple of months ago. It goes over most of those studies. And just to give you an example of management of coagulopathy and TBI, there were two randomized controlled trials. They also had uh, a subgroup uh, uh, re uh, related uh, only to traumatic brain injury, but look at the number of patients. They are not that many. But it did show that if you guide the management, if we guide our management of administration of blood products based on the results of tech, it translated into significant 28-day <clears throat> mortality uh, benefit when we use this uh, viscoelastic hematological assay guided management. So what, are, what was their conclusion based on this uh, systemic review? That uh, they <clears throat> can characterize certain uh, patterns in TBI, which will give us an idea how likely this patient is going to need intervention. But at the same time, the strength, if you go strictly by evidence-based criteria, because this has not been that widely used, it's not such, such a strong evidence. But at least to me personally, it makes sense. If we have a diagnostic modality available, we should guide our therapeutic interventions because blood products, if used unnecessarily, can do harm. We should use them based on the uh, most accurate information available on the tech results. Okay? 
So let's go over a few of the case series and then we will have questions at the end. I think we should be able to finish in another five to 10 minutes. So this is, these are all patients who came uh, to our ICU in the last few months. So this, a couple of them uh, had uh, abdominal surgeries and then we will go over patients who came in with head feet so that we have an idea. So this was an elderly lady. She came in for an elective procedure, uh, underwent a cystectomy, need, needed some blood products intra-op, but post-op, uh, once everybody had left, she basically became unstable and needed massive transfusion of blood products. And subsequently, there was some degree of quasi-stability. Overnight, needed another unit of blood. And by next morning, she had become profoundly hypotensive. She was cyanotic and needed massive transfusion of blood products and had to be taken back to OR uh, for, for re-exploration. So let's, let's see what were, what were the tag results which were available as the patient came out from OR. We can see over here, this is an example where the maximal amplitude, the normal values are 53 to 68. So right there, and then we know that irrespective of what the coags are or what the fibrinogen values are for this patient or the platelet count, this patient is not forming any clots at all. Because look at the maximal amplitude, it's very low, right? And is it because there isn't much contribution by fibrinogen or is it because there isn't much contribution by the type of platelets? It doesn't really matter because, because we, we can see that the clot strength is not there. And you can see that when they were trying to look at the contribution of fibrinogen, they were unable to determine that because the graph values were so narrow. So right there and then we have our answer that this patient needs cryoprecipitate to fix the fibrinogen contribution and clot strength, as well as platelets, because the clot which is formed is not strong enough. It is not achieving the maximal amplitude. Okay, so this is an example. And once these things were taken care of, subsequently they were able to achieve hemodynamic stability. And we can see that over here, that even to begin with, when this patient first came in, her R time was low. So if at all, she was a bit hypercoagulable. And when she came out from OR, the, this value was within normal range, although towards the higher side of normal. So normal range is 4.6 to 9.1 minutes, and her R time was 8.2. So if we did not have this back base baseline value, we, we would have said that, oh, maybe this patient does not need FFP. But when we compare these two things together, I would argue that we should give this patient FFP as well, because look at the amount of R time which has increased in this patient. And this is not somebody where a fancy vascular anastomosis has been done, where we are worried that over, over coagulation is going to compromise uh, that. It's not a plastic surgery or an ENT patient where we are worried about. Uh, plotting of, of, uh, of, of flap anastomosis. So, so this is how having a baseline value and comparing it to, to the values at that time when a patient is an extremist gives us an idea. And we can see that by next day, they were with, with the administration of blood products, they were able to achieve a nearly normal R time. Second thing over here is the maximal amplitude. So we can see that when she came in before the procedure, her maximal amplitude, I hope it shows up at your end, is 58 uh, millimeters, so which is acceptable. Normal range is 52 to 70, but when she came out from OR, it was less than 40. So that's where our answer is that this patient needed or needs cryoprecipitate and platelets. And once they were given, we can see that she was able to go back to how where, where her baseline was. And over here, we can see that it teases out the difference uh, differentiation or the separate contribution of fibrinogen. When she first came in, a maximal amplitude contributed by fibrinogen or the citrate fibrinogen time. The range is between 15 to 30, hers was 20. And then when she came out from OR, it had gone all the way down to five millimeters. So this was our answer that this patient needs cryoprecipitates. Okay, and once they were given, we can see that it went back to its normal value. So that's how using this uh, tag, again, comparing it to the patient's baseline, gives us an idea what platelets or what type of blood products to use. And the products that we use will are again going to be either FFP or cryoprecipitate and platelets. Okay, now let's go over another patient. He came in, he had uh, decompensated cirrhosis, but he also had thrombophilia because he had uh, presented with splenic infarcts in the past. He was on a Pixaban because of that. And he had a fall from the stairs and he came in with, uh, came in altered. Now he was altered because he had a pedicancephalopathy or uh, he had uh, intracranial bleed. They found out because initially this information about the fall was not available. All, 
all they had was that this is somebody with cirrhosis who was altered at his uh, assisted facility where he was living. And once this information came in that he also had a fall, so they obtained a CAT scan. It was a few hours after his presentation. And then he, they were able to identify that this patient had intracranial bleed. Now we can look at his values. He had elevated bilirubin, he had elevated INR, he had, you know, quote unquote, acceptable platelets because they were more than 100,000. But look how low his hemoglobin was and how high his lactic acid was and his fibrinogen was also low. And subsequent labs showed that his platelet counts had also become less than 100,000. And his INR had increased to 7.5 and his, his uh, APTD had also increased. So this tag was ordered, but you know, somehow it didn't really make it to the lab or the lab didn't process it. So he was managed by using the conventional parameters. And what are the conventional parameters that we use? We try to aim for INR less than 1.4 and we achieve that either by giving FFP or vitamin K or uh, four, uh, four factor plasma cell components, k centra. And we try to make our platelet counts more than 100,000 because this patient had intracranial bleed and we want the fibrinogen to be more than 200. But again, this is oversimplification because TEG, if we had that result available, would have given us an idea how to tailor these administration of blood products to that particular patient's need. Okay. Let's go over another patient. This uh, again had uh, underwent a major GYN related abdominal surgery, needed some blood products. So we can see that she had normal tech values. And although her post-op labs showed that her platelet count had decreased and her fibrinogen had uh, gone up, but when we looked at her tech values, they were all in normal range. So it wasn't taking too long for clot to form. Once it was being formed, it had a decent amount of maximal amplitude and the contribution by fibrinogen was also there. So this is an example of a patient. So this was done somewhere uh, halfway through the case that she did not need, or this particular patient did not need more blood product transfusion, irrespective of what these numbers were. Okay. Now let's go over uh, 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 this patient. He was transferred from nursing home again for altered mental status. He had alcoholic cirrhosis, had uh, systemic encephalopathy, was quote unquote on aspirin, nobody knew was he actually taking it or not. And he had a cerebellar intracranial uh, hemorrhage with obstructive hydrocephalus. And these are his lab values. We can see his INR was elevated, his ABDD was prolonged, his platelets were barely there where they should be at least more than 100,000. He had low albumin and elevated bilirubin and his fibrinogen was less than 200. Uh, less than 200. So what, how was he managed? Initially, he was given platelets and K-Centra, the prothrombin complex concentrate, and despite multiple transfusions of uh, platelets because of his uh, liver dysfunction and uh, splenic enlargement, we were never able to achieve platelet counts more than 100,000. And what were his platelet uh, mapping when he, when he came in? We can see over here, right there and then, that the maximal amplitude is low. So this gives us an idea that fibrinogen and platelets are not effective in this person. So he needs cryoprecipitate as well as platelets. But does he need more cryoprecipitate than platelets? We can see that the contribution of platelet is fair, by, uh, contribution of fibrinogen is, is fairly, uh, fairly normal. The range is between 2 to 20, and it was 4.6. So that's where our answer is that he does not need cryoprecipitate based on these two values. But look at his platelets. What was the maximal amplitude of platelets achieved once they were stimulated by ADP? Less than 10. And this person, there was no history of him taking Plavix but somehow his platelets were acting as though they have been completely inhibited by, uh, by administration of some medicine which had effects similar to Plavix. And did they respond to, uh, to stimulation by arachidonic acid? No, but relatively more than how they responded to ADP. So this is our answer here, that irrespective of his platelet count, this person has dysfunctional platelets and he needs platelet transfusion so that they start contributing to clot formation, okay? So this is basically our idea here that we give this patient uh, platelets. Now let's look at his attack for the whole blood. You can see over here that the clot formation, although he had elevated uh, INR, his clot starts to form within reasonable amount of time, within 4.6 uh, minutes. So here's Okay, this reaction time is, is normal. So based on this, he does not need FFP. 
But how about the maximal amplitude? Again, we can see based on this that it didn't it did not make maximal it thought did not achieve maximal amplitude, and the contribution of fibrinogen based on this value was low. So so this is somebody who we are going to give cryoprecipitate as well as platelets to to counter the coagulopathy in this particular case. Okay, let's go over uh, this patient. He's 38 years old, had history of anxiety, hypertension, polysubstance abuse. He would get you know, he'd make, buy things off the street and use them. And then he would come in uh, under the influence of those medicines at home. And this was fairly normal for him. But at this time he started having seizures and his family brought him to the hospital. And everybody was initially thinking that could this be an alcohol uh, withdrawal seizure. But once he had his uh, imaging, it showed that he had subdural hematoma. He was taken to OR, operated upon. They were able to achieve good hemostasis. And the uh, the bone flap was placed back. And as soon as the patient arrived in SICU, they noticed that he, he had increased bleeding from his veins. He had his post-op CAT scan, which showed that the hematoma had reaccumulated and he needed to be taken back emergently to OR and this time had hemicraniacty. Now, while he was in OR, look at the, the results which, which were present on presentation. His platelet count was 146,000. Low for somebody who is otherwise healthy, but it had decreased to 83. But irrespective of the number, look how his platelets were, were performing when they were stimulated by different type of reagents. We can see over here that this is his R time, which is normal, but the maximal amplitude, which is achieved, is low. It's borderline there. 52 is the lower limit of normal, and his was 51.5, so it was barely there. And the contribution of fibrinogen was fairly normal. Again, low limit of normal, but it was there. So these values give us an idea that something is wrong with the contribution of platelets in clot formation. And when we look at the, uh, the tag for the platelet mapping, we can see that although he had no history of taking aspirin or Plavix, his platelets were absolutely inhibited. Look over here, the maximal amplitude achieved as though they were stimulating stimulated by ADP is only 15. So this is giving us an idea that they were 79% inhibited as though this person is taking Plavix. And how about over here when he was given AA, arachidonic acid, again, the response was barely there. And it was giving us an idea that they have been inhibited. So the substances that he was buying off the street or he was using had caused platelet dysfunction in him, similar to somebody who is also on both aspirin as well as Plavix. So, so irrespective of his platelet count, this is a patient who needed platelet transfusion. And we can see that, that it had actually gotten worse during, during his OR course. So this is where we get an idea based on the results of TAG that this, is, that, uh, this person has dysfunctional platelets. The logistics of sending this test is basically, we. this is a green top tube. It needs to be sent uh, to the hematology lab. As I said, the turnaround time is about 15 to 20 minutes. This is 40 minutes before it gets reported, but this test is available around the clock. And I will, if I can share my other screen, I will show you how, how this results in, in a graphic form. I'm going to share this second screen. My apologies, there are going to be some patient names there. Well, there's no tags done in our system. So let me see if I can click on today. And let's start sharing this screen. Uh, let me see. Are you able to see the screen with the graphs? Yes. Okay, so we can see that that's how this test is reported in, in real time. So, so the, these are platelet map, mapping examples. So this is the maximal clot strength, which was achieved both by fibrinogen as well as platelets. This is how they have separated out the contribution of fibrinogen. And this is where they are trying to stimulate the platelets by giving ADP and AA. And we can see that, that, look at the difference between this graph and this graph. 
So this is a person in whom if we are encountering bleeding, is going to need platelet transfusion, irrespective of what his platelet count are, okay? So, so this, this is how, without waiting for the numbers to be resulted, just by looking at the graph, gives us this information. And this is his uh, tag for the whole blood. So we can see that it did not take that long for the blood clot uh, to form. We can see the range over here within uh, minutes towards the higher range of normal, but not, not abnormal, not completely abnormal. This is the maximal strength of the clot, which is achieved. And we have the number over here that this is in normal range. And how much is the contribution of fibrinogen? Maybe based on these results, the fibrinogen is sort of quote unquote over contributing in, in, uh, in the strengthening of the clot. So, so just by looking at these two graphs, it gives us an idea that, that this particular patient has dysfunctional platelets. And if we are encountering bleeding, irrespective of numbers, this patient is going to need platelet transfusion to, to counter that. And I guess that's that's the end of my presentation. I'll be happy to take questions if there are any. And let me see if I can start the video. Okay. Should I click on Great. the chat and see if there are questions? Yeah. Thanks, Dr. Body. Um, yeah, I can I can read off the questions for you actually. Um, that, was a, that was an excellent excellent talk and excellent overview and examples. Um, Dr. Kapanos had a couple questions. Um, one, the first one was K versus alpha angle already distinguishes the need for cryoprecipitate versus platelets. So when do we need kaolin and citrate to enhance the tag or is it just accelerating the results? So it basically accelerates the result, yes. So, so, the, so the tag which, are, which is used in clinical uh, form by this, by this vendor is accelerated tag. So it, it gives us same information, but in less amount of time. Yes. I hope that does. Uh, next question. What, next question was: Can uh, platelet mapping help decide between the need for DDAVP versus platelet transfusion? And if so, how how much to give? So so yes, this is an excellent question. I I'll have to 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 see if there is any data available to support it. But, but platelet dysfunction because of uremia potentially can be reversed by giving DDAVP. So my answer would be if we have this tag available, we give that particular patient DDAVP and we repeat the tag. If, if it shows uh, that, uh, that the contribution or the stimulation or the way platelets respond with AA and ADP has improved, then that's our answer that, that, that this platelet dysfunction was reversed by DDAVP. If it does not improve, then, then that means that these platelets, for whatever reason, are you know, dysfunctional to the point that DDAVP alone will not fix it, and then we give them uh, platelets. So that's, that would be my I guess, sim simplified answer. Yeah. I guess to, um, you know, along those lines, because I, I don't know the answer to this, but I presume that the number of platelets, too, would also impact that maximal amplitude, correct? Like, I mean, because presumably if you had zero platelets, you would have no maximal amplitude. So if you're thrombocytopenic, that will potentially affect that value, I would assume. So I, I think like if you're not thrombocytopenic, then yeah, it would be reasonable to give DDAVP first and see if that changes it. Um, particularly since a lot of, there's a fair amount of data, like empirical studies that have shown that giving DDAVP seems to help and giving platelets <laughs> doesn't seem to help so much. Depends, depends you know. Um, uh, so another question uh, regarding that, um, are you able to distinguish using TAG, um, or is it helpful at least, in distinguishing between uh, platelet dysfunction that's caused by alcohol or herbal medications or renally induced platelet dysfunction? So, so the way the tag works is it is just going to show the response of the platelets to that stimulating agent. So is, is there a particular pattern that gives us an idea that, oh, with alcohol, they don't respond that much to AA and they are less responsive to ADP with some other substance? I don't know the answer to that, but, uh, but, but definitely there are multiple examples of patients who were not on aspirin or Plavix, but they were using one of the, either a herbal supplement or some uh, nutritional supplement, or some people just, just by taking a particular brand of tea 
or alcohol where when they were when they had these tag results done it was showing that their platelets are dysfunctional so it, it it basically just gives the information that how those platelets are responding to the stimulating agent it doesn't really tell us that what particular uh, agent caused the dysfunction is that does that answer it to some extent okay. yeah. yep no that, that that answers it perfect um and then uh, another question was, um, in your experience, how often do you need to repeat the tag? Um, and do transfused platelets get inactivated by circulating medication? So, so absolutely. So, so depending upon the half-life of the medication, which is, uh, which is already present in our system, if, you know, if, if that medication is present in pharmacological amount, it is going to cause better dysfunction even to the transfused platelets as well. And the platelets, once they are transfused, they have a half-life of about six to eight hours. So, so as such, they don't last very long in our in our body. So, so I, yes, we if, if we encounter a patient in whom we are having difficulty controlling uh, the, the bleeding or you know the hemodynamic stability, and we are worried about ongoing bleeding, absolutely we repeat it. We we give our blood products and we repeat and we taper our therapy based on the subsequent information. Yes, it, it can be repeated. And it should, I would, I would say it should be repeated, especially in neurosurgery, the cases are long. I mean, if it's a 10, 12, 16 hour long case, we can't really go by, by the results which were present in the beginning of a case. And if something has, untoward has taken place in between and products have been given, it should be, it, it should be repeated, absolutely. Great, thank you. Um, I mean, I think your examples to me at least Seem to, uh, I mean, in my mind, it would argue that we should, that, that we're not using tag enough, and that we really should, probably should be getting kind of baseline tags on all of our traumas coming in. Because even if it's not abnormal at that point in time, you get you're getting a baseline, so that when something happens later and you get one, you can see and you you showed a few examples where maybe even the the absolute value is not necessarily abnormal, but like you know, particular that first one, but you know, there's been a, a definite change in, in kind of the overall profile and that if the R time is now, you know, eight or nine and it was, it came in and it was like, you know, much shorter before that could be an indication that something's going on. And that, and that even in, you know, our elective cases, it's not a bad idea to, if you're doing a tumor case or a big spine case, sending a tag at the beginning of the case as you're getting started so that, and then at the end and then post-operatively so that, you know, if there is an issue either on the regular labs or any sort of bleeding issue that it's, you know, you have that, that uh, data over time already um, with a baseline. Um, you know, because I think, you know, it, it's again, it's one of those technologies. I think we're, you know, we're, we're just starting to use it here where, you know, the more you use it, the, the more facile we become with it in interpreting and the more we're, we're likely to believe what it's telling us and, and actually act upon it and use it to, as it was intended. But if we're kind of just getting it sporadically here and there, it, it makes kind of, yeah, that a little bit harder. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there have been, uh, you know, the, the, the literature which is available is mostly retrospective, but it can be done prospectively because people have tried to use Let's say somebody comes in with penetrating head trauma, but does not need uh, an intervention as of now. But good looking at the tech trend, give us an idea that is this somebody who's likely to have hematoma expansion and how likely he is to need subsequent neurosurgical intervention. Because then maybe mm -hmm. if that uh, if that thing can be established and there are some, some people in whom it can be done proactively or preemptively rather than waiting for them to deteriorate, and then proceed with an intervention because you know, in, in those cases, each and every minute means a lot in terms of uh, subsequent uh, neurologic recovery. So, so they have used those uh, studies, but because they were case reviews or retrospective, so they did not have enough strength to conclusively suggest that uh, using a tech will, will be beneficial. But, but there were uh, trends indicating that, yes, if we use it often, it is going to give us the helpful information. One last question, and then we'll let you go. <laughs> the last one is that, um, in your experience, is there an optimal treatment or general treatment to reverse aspirin eighty one? In, in other words, should we give DDAP or should we give a unit of platelets, or does this, or should we be basing this decision off of uh, the tag uh, so that we can individualize that? 
So I, I, I think the right answer would be we should use that because that gives us an idea about how, because you know, as, 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 as we have examples, there are people who are on aspirin, but their platelets are, are, are not uh, inhibited at all. So if that's the case, and we have a proof based on tech, we can, you know, we can avoid giving that patient uh, DDAVP or platelets. So that, that would be my, my answer, that if it is logistically not difficult to obtain this test, especially if it's if it's a you know if, if it's an if it's a spine case or, uh, or or a neurosurgical elective case absolutely we should get a tech we should get an idea even if our patients have stopped taking aspirin for three days let's say we, that's that's the standard uh, advice that we give them before elective cases we do not know for sure how dysfunctional their platelets still could be or could they still be dysfunctional from something else so my suggestion would be to to do a tech and based on that if there is an opportunity, give them platelets and repeat it again to show that that effect has been counted properly. Yeah, I would I would even argue that you know if you have the time, you know get get a tag and then like as we said before, you know maybe even give them DDAVP then after the tag and see if it if if that improves the things or corrects everything and then. If it, you know, I mean, again, the tag comes by pretty quickly. Indeed, the effect of DDAVP should be pretty rapid. Um, you know, once it circulates once throughout the body, it should basically uh, take an effect. So, um, if you have like 20 minutes or so like that, you know, it's not like a crash emergency. You could probably give the DDAVP and repeat the tag, uh, you know, like five minutes after the DDAVP has been given and see if that's improved things before giving platelets and needed. And I think I mean, the more we use technology, I'll give my, my own example. I've never placed a central line without using an IJ central line without using an ultrasound. And, you know, when I was starting my training, people used to sort of look down upon it saying, that, why don't you use landmark technique? And I said, look, I have something available which makes life easy for me and safe for the patient. So I think maybe we can mm -hmm. extend the same type of analogy here that we have uh, a test available if it helps uh, guide uh, treatment and make it a little safe, more safe for our patients. And if, if we can use it, why not make use of it? I'm not saying that we should absolutely use it in each and every case, but if we have the time, might as well use it and cater the, the management accordingly to that particular, individualize it to that particular patient. Agreed, agreed. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Body. That, that was excellent. We will be putting this, um, just so everybody knows, all of our prior lectures are on our neurosurgery YouTube uh, channel, and there's like a separate channel for neurotrauma. We'll be putting this one up. We'll blur the name in the MRN so that it's not up there. Um, but we will, once we've done that, we will be putting that up there as well. And our next neurotrauma conference lecture will be on December 17th. It won't be the 24th because that's the day before Christmas. <laughs> so we'll do it on the 17th. Thanks again, Dr. Vadi. Oh, welcome. Appreciate it very Thank much. You. Thank you for the opportunity. Thanks. Bye bye. Have a good day, everybody. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Have a good weekend. Have a good Friday.